Hi, everyone, and welcome to Astro at Home, presented by Discover the Universe. As you guys know, we normally teach your teachers astronomy, uh, but while we're all learning from home, we're really excited to come in and teach you guys directly. Uh, before I introduce you to our speaker for today and our topic, I want to remind you guys about our house rules, which are just to have some respect for one another in the chat and not spam the chat. We do ask that you send us as many questions as you like. We'll answer as many as we can get to within a half hour. and um, we'll do our, our best to uh, get through those for you. Um, today, I'm very excited to introduce you or reintroduce you to Professor Mike Reed from the Dunlap Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics. And he's gonna be talking to us today about the cosmic distan distance ladder. There we go, <laughs> there it is. Okay, hello everybody, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Wonderful. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, coming this afternoon to learn a little bit about what I hope will be an exciting topic, uh, the cosmic distance ladder. So I'm going to talk to you today about something we don't often talk about in astronomy, which is this very fundamental thing that we have to do to understand the universe, but which often doesn't make the headlines. And that is measure how far stuff is in space. Now you may wonder why is this such a big deal in astronomy? Well, let me try and uh, cast your minds back a little bit in history to say about a hundred years ago, the early 20th century. This was a time when people could look up in the sky the same way you could today, but they didn't have the same idea of what the universe was like as we do today. So they would look up, they would see dots of light in the sky, they knew those were stars, and they would sometimes see little fuzzy patches of light and they didn't really know what those were. So this is one such patch of sky that uh, many of you, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you'll be able to see this pretty easily. Um, this is a set of constellations that maybe you're not too familiar with. Some of you may know Cassiopeia, which is up on the uh, upper left-hand corner there. Let me just highlight that for you. So this is Cassiopeia up here. But in the middle of this image is the constellation of Andromeda. Not always an easy constellation to pick out, but it's famous for one reason. And that reason is that it has this fuzzy blob in the middle of it, which you may hopefully be able to see. So that fuzzy blob uh, and, and other things in the sky like it caused astronomers a lot of concern in the early part of the 20th century when they tried to figure out what it was. Uh, and there was so much debate. Some people thought, oh, it's some thing in our atmosphere, you know, some fuzzy little cloud or something like that that hangs around. Maybe other people thought, well, it's something in our solar system, some little cloud of gas maybe hanging around among the planets. Other people thought, oh, it's some kind of star cluster pretty near the Earth, right? All sorts of different ideas. But where these uh, differed was in how far away we thought this thing was. So some people thought maybe it had something to do with Earth. It was really close, a few hundred kilometers maybe. Other people, maybe it's in the solar system. It was maybe a few million or a few billion kilometers. And still other people thought it was outside the solar system. But until they were able to measure the distance to this little thing, uh, they couldn't really work out what it was. And once they were able to measure the distance, it totally transformed our understanding of what the universe was. So we're going to go through today um, some of the different techniques that we use to measure distances to things like this little thing there, which some of you may know now, uh, we know as the Andromeda galaxy. So we now know that this object is a collection of billions of stars, and it's really, really far away, millions of light years. So that means light from this Andromeda galaxy takes millions of years to get to us. But how did we figure any of that out? So let's just consider a, a typical picture of the sky. This is um, one taken at an observatory in Chile. The observatory is called ALMA. And this is someone's photograph they took uh, near these telescopes. And if you look up into a nice dark sky like this, you see all sorts of things. So you see lots of little stars in the sky, some bright ones, some dim ones. You see some sort of fuzzy patches of gas in the background. But if I asked you to tell me how do you know which of those stars is the farthest away? How, how can you tell whether this one or this one or this one is the farthest away? That's really challenging, right? You might naturally assume, okay, the one in the middle, the bright blue one, that one must be closest. Uh, and the 
little kind of dim red one, that one must be farthest away. And you would be basing that probably on your assumption that if something looks brighter, it should be closer. And if it looks dimmer, it should be further away. And that's a reasonably good way of thinking of things, but we'll see uh, shortly that that actually doesn't always work in astronomy. There are bright stars and there are dim stars. Uh, and it can be very confusing whether you're looking at a bright thing that is close to you, uh, or rather a bright thing that is far away or a dim thing that is close to you. Both of those can look the same. So I'm gonna come back to those in just a minute. So this whole problem of how to measure the distances to things in space has been a big problem for astronomers for centuries. And only in the last hundred years, and especially in the last couple of decades, have we gotten really, really good at very, very precise measurements of the distances to things in space. But even still, there are lots of objects that we would love to know the distance to, but it's still challenging. So we use a whole set of different techniques for measuring the distances to objects in space. Uh, different ones work over different distances. So if you want to measure the distance to an object in our solar system, like a planet, for example, or an asteroid, you would use one method. But if you want to measure the distance to a star, say near the solar system, that's a different method. If you want to measure the distance to a galaxy, like the Andromeda galaxy, that's a different method. If you want to measure the distance to a really distant galaxy halfway across the universe, that's another method. So lots and lots of different methods that we use, but they all work together and we, we build them into this thing called the cosmic distance ladder. And one of the reasons we like this analogy of a ladder is that in a ladder, all the rungs fit together and you wind up with this sort of uh, single tool that you can use to get from one place to another. Uh, with the cosmic distance ladder, all the rungs are connected. So we use one piece to help us work out the next piece, to help us work out the next piece and the next piece and the next piece. And by doing that, we sort of climb this cosmic distance ladder. So there are many rungs to the cosmic distance ladder. I'm going to take you through three of them today, and then you can ask me any questions you may want. So the first one is the closest to home. How do we measure the distances to the very nearest astronomical objects? Uh, and the easiest way to do that for the very closest astronomical object is to use what we call laser ranging. Uh, and I'll show you what that means. So here's a picture of that object. Uh, that is the moon, right? The moon is the nearest astronomical object to the Earth. But if I were to ask you, given this picture, this is a real photo someone took with a camera, you know, went outside with their nice camera and aimed it at the moon, and they waited until an airplane crossed in front of the moon, took the photo. So if I ask you, uh, which is bigger, the airplane or the moon? If you really don't know much about either object, the picture doesn't really tell you. You know, because you've seen airplanes on Earth, that an airplane is, you know, small, maybe it's 100 meters long or so. And you know that the moon, you've learned in school, it's much bigger than that. It's a big object in space. But here, again, you are able to tell in this picture that the airplane is small and therefore must be close, and the moon is big and therefore must be far, only because you already knew the sizes of these objects. But if you really didn't know, if some other object appears in the sky and you don't know how big that object is, then you can't use that trick of saying, ah, okay, well, I know how big it is. So depending on how big it looks, I can work out how far away it is. So you could be really confused as to whether the airplane or the moon is the bigger object in this case, if you didn't know what their distances were. So we can use this method to judge distances in astronomy where you know the size of the object and therefore you can tell how far away it is based on how big it looks. But that means we have to have some way of knowing the size of an object, which we usually don't know. Usually we do it the other way around. We, we measure the distance and that allows us to calculate the size. So uh, for the moon, we can't just know its size. We have to measure its distance and then calculate its size. So how do we do that? Well, it happens that for the moon and for some of the nearer planets, you can basically just bounce light off them and test or measure how long it takes for the light to return to us. So uh, with the moon, you can bounce a laser off the moon, shine a laser light at the moon. It will bounce off the moon. You can use a very precise clock to time how long, you know, you 
you start your clock when you send the laser and then you wait until you get uh, the reflected light back from the moon and you measure how long that took and you find it's about two and a half seconds. Uh, and then you know how quickly light travels. So using the speed of light and the time it takes the light to make that trip, you can work out how far away the moon is. In the same way that if you know you're going down the highway in a car at 100 kilometers an hour, and you know how long you've traveled for, maybe an hour, then you know that at 100 kilometers an hour, for one hour, you go 100 kilometers. You can work out the distance. Same thing in this case. If you know how fast light goes and how long it took to make the trip to the moon, you can work out how far away the moon is. Now, with the moon, this is much easier than for any other object in astronomy, and that's because human beings have been to the moon before. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s, the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, and one of the things they did there to help us make better measurements of the distance to the moon was leave these little things called retro reflectors on the moon. Uh, so that's the sort of little mirror-like device that allows us to uh, bounce lasers off the moon and then uh, get the light back at Earth and measure the round trip travel time. So that's really convenient. It lets us easily and very, very accurately measure the distance to the moon. Now, for other objects in the solar system, like say one of the nearest planets, Venus, um, there's no retro reflector. No one has already put a mirror on, the, on Venus for us. So we do something that's very, very similar, but using a slightly different technology. Instead of bouncing uh, visible light off, like a laser off Venus, we bounce radio waves off Venus. Uh, and so basically we use the entire planet as a reflector, but we do basically the same thing. We bounce radio waves off Venus, we measure how long uh, they take to return to us, and that allows us to work out how far away Venus is. And then using those measurements, we can work out how far away all the other bits and pieces of the solar system are. So we can work out how far away is Jupiter or Mars or Mercury or all of the other planets in the solar system um, by using the distance to Venus. That's a little trickier, but that's basically how we do it. So the idea is that for objects that are relatively close to us in our solar system, we just bounce light off them and time how long it takes to come back. That's the first rung of the cosmic distance ladder. The second rung uh, is a big leap after that. It's for measuring distances to things beyond the solar system. Like for example, nearby stars to the sun. So to help you understand this method, which has this kind of funny sounding name, parallax, uh, we're gonna do a little experiment. So um, I want you to think for a second, maybe uh, you can you know, turn to your, your, you've got a sibling at home with you or a friend or something and ask yourself, why do you have two eyeballs? Why not just one eye? Wouldn't that be, you know, more efficient, right? Your body wouldn't have to make two of these eyeballs and keep them both healthy and things like that. Just have one eyeball, right? We could all be a cyclops, be easier. Or why not three, right? More complicated. Why do we have two eyeballs? Well, there's a really good reason for that. And you can demonstrate it to yourself very easily using this red dot. So I want everyone to uh, play along with me at home here. I want you to take your thumb and I want you to uh, stand back from the computer screen a little bit and hold your thumb uh, closer, you know, farther away from your face, more sort of um, at arm's length. And I want you to close one eye, doesn't matter which eye. Close one eye, hold your thumb so it blocks the little red dot like I'm doing, okay? And then I want you to switch the eye that's open. So basically blink your eyes back and forth, right? So you go left eye open, right eye open, left eye open, right eye open, while keeping your thumb in the same place. So what you should see is that when you cover your thumb or cover the red dot with your thumb and you switch from one eye to the other, your thumb will appear to move back and forth as you see it out of each eye independently. But now what I want you to do is hold your thumb really close to your face, again, block it out with one eye, and then blink back and forth like that. So what you should see is when you hold your thumb close to your face and you blink back and forth, your thumb jumps a whole lot to one side. 
Whereas when you hold it out at arm's length and you blink back and forth, it barely jumps at all. If you hold it way out at arm's length, in fact, it may not even jump all the way off the red dot. Whereas when you hold it close to your face, it should jump way away from the red dot as you go back and forth between your two eyes. So this is a clue as to why we have two eyes. This is something we call depth perception. It's our ability to tell how far away our thumb is from our face as we view it from two different perspectives. So as you view your thumb when it's close to your face, as you view it from one eye than the other, uh, because it's so close to your face, uh, it appears to jump back and forth a lot. Whereas when it's far from your face, it doesn't jump back and forth as much. And your brain is constantly noticing that about objects in the environment. So as you look around your room, your brain is noticing, oh, okay, as I move my head or as I compare the two views from my two eyes, objects that are close move a lot. They differ a lot between one eye and the other. Whereas objects that are far away don't differ very much. So if you look out a window and you look far away, uh, the view from your two eyes is basically the same of distant objects. So we can make use of this in astronomy to measure the distances to stars. And people have known this for thousands of years, but only relatively recently have we been able to do this very effectively. So I'm just showing you a picture here of what you should see. So if you hold your, your thumb close to your face and you open both eyes, you get this kind of blurry double vision version of your thumb. But if you view your eye or your thumb with your left eye closed, it'll be on one side of your field of view. And if you view it with your right eye closed, it will be on the other side of your field of view relative to distant objects. So that shift in the position of objects as we look from two different perspectives is called parallax. And we can use it to measure distances in space. So how do we do that? Okay, consider this setup. Uh, at the bottom of this picture here, we've got the sun and this is earth. And the gray dotted line is Earth's orbit around the sun. So this is the path Earth follows in one year. In the middle here, we've got a fairly nearby star. And then in the distance, we've got a whole bunch of very distant stars, okay? So we want to measure how far this relatively nearby star is to the solar system, okay? So here's what we do. We start on some day, doesn't matter. Let's say uh, we start when the Earth is at, at this position, which we're gonna say is January, doesn't really matter. And we take a picture of this star in the middle. So we point our telescope from the Earth toward that star. And we sight along this white uh, dashed line here. And we see that in January, this star appears to be in front of this distant white star in January. But when Earth is over here in June, if we do the same thing, we do a sight line to this nearby star, we see that, ah, from our perspective in June, the star appears to be in line with this sort of pale yellow star over here. So in this diagram, the two positions of the Earth are the same as the two eyeballs in your head. Uh, in your eyes, you have both views simultaneously all the time. One eye looking one way, one eye looking the other way. But we can replicate that with our whole planet using its orbit around the sun. We can say that the Earth in January, that's like your right eye. The Earth in June on the other side of the sun, that's like your left eye. And they both get slightly different views uh, of, of nearby stars. And the fact that this star appears uh, to overlap different distant stars at different times of year allows us to determine how far away it is. Basically, this amount by which it appears to shift compared to background stars is a measure of how far away that nearby star, the red outlined one, is. So to see that, let's just imagine moving that star farther away and do the same thing again. If we move the star farther away, you can see that the shift in its position from January to June is much smaller than uh, if the star was closer to us. So by observing stars and noting how their positions appear to shift as Earth orbits around the sun, we can work out their distances. There's a tiny little bit of math behind that, but it's not very hard. Uh, now these shifts, of course, are tiny. 
You can't see them with your naked eye. People tried that for thousands of years, couldn't do it. So if you go outside, you look out uh, at the sky at night and you look at a star in January and you look at it in June, it won't appear to move at all. But if you use a telescope and you can take very, very, very precise measurements, you can notice that the position changes uh, from time to time. And you can use that to work out the distance. So how is that useful? Well, there's a satellite up in space right now called Gaia. And Gaia is making measurements of the positions of millions and billions of stars. So I'm showing you this little movie here. What you're seeing right now, it looks like it's a picture. It's not a, an actual photograph of space. This is uh, many millions of stars, each drawn as a little dot uh, it, to make something that looks a lot like a photograph. But you're going to see that this is actually a computer simulation because this Gaia spacecraft is able to use this parallax technique to measure the distances to many, many, many stars. And that allows us to make a three-dimensional model of where all of those stars are. And you can see in this little video that uh, as we build this computer model and then shift our perspective back and forth a little bit, you can actually see this parallax effect. So you can see that the nearby stars move a lot and the more distant ones move less. So if we label which constellations those stars are in, you can see that from the perspective of uh, the satellite, you know, moving back and forth, in, in a sense, it could see these um, constellations change their shape. It would actually have to move uh, a very great distance for it to, to notice that. But um, because it's a very, very precisely, um, makes very, very precise measurements, it can actually measure those tiny ships. So what this movie is now showing is what the positions of those stars will be in the distant future. Because knowing their distances and knowing how fast they're moving, we can actually plot what their courses will be for thousands and thousands of years into the future. And we can work out where all of the stars that we can see uh, with this satellite will be in thousands or millions of years. So that's the parallax measurement method. And parallax allows us to measure the distances to nearby stars, okay? Stars within our own Milky Way galaxy, um, but well outside our own solar system, okay? Now, what if you wanna measure a really big distance? What if you wanna know the distance to something way outside our Milky Way galaxy, the galaxy that we live in? Well, there's a bunch of different methods, but the one that allows us to see extremely far and measure distances extremely far uses exploding stars, exploding stars. So let's say you have a scenario like this. This is a very famous picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and in this picture, you might think, oh, it's a bunch of stars. It's not a bunch of stars. Almost every little kind of blob in, the, in this picture is a galaxy a galaxy like our own Milky Way galaxy. So the Milky Way contains a few hundred billion stars and each of these little dots in this image also contains a few hundred billion stars. But because these galaxies are so far away, we can't make out individual stars in them. And we certainly can't detect their tiny little parallax motions as you know we orbit the sun. It's too small to measure. So we need another method. Now, because these galaxies are very, very, very far away, we need some thing, some object that we can you know, easily detect even from an extremely far distance and that we can use to measure a distance. So let me give you a sort of an analogy here to help you uh, understand how we do this. So if I show you this uh, picture of a bunch of candles, how would you know which candle was farthest away from the camera. How do you know which one is farthest from the camera? Now there's a couple of ways you could know this. Um, one is you could, you could use what we call perspective. You could see, okay, they're all in little dishes and the more distant dishes look smaller because they're farther away. But what if I dim the lights so much that you couldn't see the dishes, you could only see the flame, okay? then what you might say is, oh, okay, well, the flame that's closest to us is going to appear brightest, and the flame that's farthest away is going to appear dimmest. So we can use the brightness of the flame to work out how far away the candle is. 
But again, that only works if you know that the candles are all the same, okay? If the candles are all the same, then the farthest away one is going to appear the dimmest and the closest one will appear the brightest. This would be really complicated though, if uh, you didn't know that the candles were all the same. Maybe the really far, the candle you thought was really far away is actually really close, but it's a tiny, tiny candle. Or maybe the one that looks like it's close is actually um, a very dim candle that's just very close to your eye, or one that's very, very far away could be uh, very, very bright, but so far away that it looks like it's, it's dim, right? There's this ambiguity between uh, how bright a thing appears and how close it appears. But there is a certain kind of object um, in astronomy whose brightness we can know. So just like these candles, we know that these candles are all the same, so we can use the brightness to determine the distance. There's a kind of, of phenomenon uh, in astronomy that's like uh, what we call a standard candle. It's like having candles that are all the same planted throughout the universe. And that phenomenon is exploding stars, or a particular kind of exploding star. So when some stars die, stars that are a lot bigger than the sun, when they die, they blow up. This won't happen to our sun, but it will happen to some other stars. And when they blow up, uh, a certain kind of them blows up in a particular way that always looks basically the same. They are always about the same brightness, very, very close to the same brightness. And so as long as we know that it was that kind of star that blew up, then we will be able to say for sure how bright it is. And then if we know how bright it actually is, then the difference between how bright it actually is and how bright it looks is just a measure of how far away it is, right? So again, if you have uh, two candles that are the same brightness, you hold them at the same distance to your face, they will look the same brightness. But if you take one of them and hold it much farther away from your face, it will look dimmer. Even though it's the same, just the fact that it's further away means it looks dimmer. So this particular kind of star, you're seeing one here. This is a picture of another galaxy. Uh, this galaxy is called M82. And uh, this galaxy, with the galaxy is the kind of gray streak in the background. But right here where those little lines are pointing to, you can see that there's a little light flashing on and off. And that's because we're flipping between two pictures of this galaxy, one without an exploding star and one with an exploding star. So what happened in this galaxy is that it contains many, many billions of stars, but just by coincidence, when we were looking at it, one of those stars blew up and that produces a very, very bright light, immensely bright light, much brighter than the star itself would normally be. You can see in one of these images, you can't even see the star uh, until it blows up. But when a star like that blows up, if it's the right kind of star blowing up, then we right away know exactly how bright it actually was. And so by measuring how bright it appears to our eye, we can work out how far away it must be and therefore how far away the galaxy that it lives in must be. So here's another set of pictures, not blinking this time. Same galaxy, uh, and the arrows are pointing to a place where there doesn't appear to be anything in particular going on. And then in the other image, you can see there's this bright light. So I'll circle that for you so you can see. So what's changed there is that uh, in the image on the right, one of the stars in this galaxy has blown up. So again, by knowing what kind of star it was that blew up, that kind of star, if it's the right kind, we will immediately know how bright it was when it blew up, and we can work out the distance to the galaxy that way. So in astronomy, we call objects like this, these stars that blow up and all have the same brightness, we call them standard candles for exactly the same reason as you see in this image. If you have a bunch of candles and you know they're all the same, they're all standard, then the, the brightness tells you how far away they are. So this is a method we can use to measure distances all the way across the universe, basically. About as far as we can see, we can use this method to measure the distances to distant galaxies. You have to wait until a star blows up to use it, 
but that's okay. Uh, we observe huge parts of the sky every night and we catch a lot of these supernovae. So over time, we can uh, start to map out the distances to many, many, many different galaxies using this method. So to wrap up, uh, I want to give you a sense of what can you learn about the universe by measuring distances? Well, we've already seen a bunch of things. We, one of the first things we learned was, wow, the, those little fuzzy smudges we see in the sky, those aren't clouds of gas or planets or something in our own solar system. Those are huge galaxies that are tremendously far away. We only know that because of this set of techniques we use to measure distances. But there are so many other things. Almost everything we measure in astronomy depends in some way on knowing the distance to the object we're looking at. But I want to tell you one of the most incredible things we've learned about the universe just by very carefully measuring distances. So I just told you about this method of using supernovas, exploding stars, to measure distances. Uh, by measuring the distances to some extremely distant supernovas, some astronomers have been able to work out how the universe will end just by measuring the distances to these supernovas very carefully. So what they found when they did this was that uh, by measuring the distances to many, many different supernovae a lot across a huge span of, of the universe, a huge fraction of the universe, you can work out how fast the universe is getting bigger over time. So in this diagram, this diagram is meant to summarize for you the entire history and future of the universe. So at the bottom of the diagram is the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, when everything started. And then what the diagram is showing you is that as the universe gets older, it expands, expands, expands. And you can see at the bottom of the diagram, it starts to expand quickly. And then it sort of levels out and expands a bit more slowly for a while. But as we come toward the present, the blue part, it starts to expand quickly again. And that quick expansion is caused by something called dark energy. And it appears to tell us that in the future, our universe is not only going to get bigger forever, but it's gonna get bigger faster every day, forever and ever and ever. And so by measuring the distances to these distant supernovae, by working out how fast the universe has been getting bigger over cosmic history, we can work out how the universe is going to end. One of the many, many important things in astronomy you can work out just by measuring how far away stuff is. So I'm gonna wrap up there and I will happily take any questions you have about this topic or anything else you wanna ask about. Thank you very much. So let's see if we have some questions here. Okay, lots of, uh, lots of questions. Okay, so how many uh, star constellations are there? Oh, good, good question. So uh, we have, um, you can make up your own constellation, of course. Uh, everyone's welcome to sort of draw patterns as they like, but uh, there are 88 constellations that are officially recognized by astronomers and they cover the whole sky. Um, what's the biggest constellation? Hmm, I don't know. It, mm, Biggest constellation. There are some really big ones. I'm genuinely not sure what the biggest one is. Uh, there's a really big one called Hydra. I'm not sure. Uh, who is the first person to see a constellation? Uh, the first person who looked up at the sky and just dreamt up a picture. Because constellations are human inventions. Uh, they're pictures we draw on the sky based on our interpretation of what we think we're seeing. It's a lot like, you know, you look at a cloud and you say, oh, that cloud looks like a rabbit. Um, so there's nothing uh, about constellations that's sort of determined by the universe. Um, it's just the pictures that we choose to, to assign to them. Uh, let's see. So someone says the closer a star is, the more it is red and when it's farther, it becomes blue or is it the other way around? That's a, a really great question. It's a bit complicated. So um, the, if you consider stars that are close to us, really near to the solar system and sitting still, not, not zipping around the universe too much, then the thing that determines what color they are is actually just their temperature. So a redder star is a cooler star and a bluer star is a hotter star. It's exactly the opposite of you know, your bathroom taps, right? In, the, in a sink, you know, the red tap is the hot one and the blue tap is the cold one. It's the opposite for stars. Red is cool, 
blue is hot. But it turns out that if those stars are zipping away from you really quickly, flying through the universe at very, very fast speeds, they actually change their color as a result of their motion. And so in that case, as they zip away from you, they will get redder. So whatever color they started, they will get more red the faster they go away from you. But it's not to do with their distance, it's to do with their speed, not so much their distance. Uh, let's see. Is it true that pirates use stars to find their way around? Absolutely. Not only pirates, uh, you know, lots of people, uh, ocean navigators, uh, even today, uh, I do this. Lots of people do this, right? You go outside. Sometimes I travel. I go to a city I'm not very familiar with, um, but I can always use the sky. The sky is always there. So if you know certain constellations and you know where they appear in the sky, um, you can orient yourself. Uh, so for example, if you know the North Star, um, the North Star can be seen anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. So I live in Canada, but you know, I could travel to Europe or Asia. And as long as I can see the North Star, I always know which way North is. So the same is true on the ocean. People can use the stars to navigate their way around the ocean. Uh, what type of laser do we use to measure the distance from the Earth to the Moon? It doesn't have to be any special kind of laser. It just has to be reasonably bright. Uh, and you can shine a laser at the Moon. Some of the light will bounce back and you can measure the round trip time. No special, um, special laser required. Uh, so is a supernova the only point of reference? Um, not sure what you mean about point of reference, but um, supernovae are one way of measuring distances across the very largest distances in the, the universe, but there are actually other ways that work um, over similar distance ranges, but maybe not quite as far. Um, so we, with that distance ladder, as I say, we use one measurement to sort of calibrate or to help us um, establish the accuracy of the next measurement. So we might use parallax to help us measure the distance to um, some star cluster where there's a supernova. And so we use the parallax to tell us how far away that star cluster is. And then we use that to help us understand the supernova. And then when we see a supernova happen even further away, we can use the nearby measurements to help us understand the farther away one. How do we measure the distance from the Earth to a black hole? That's not easy. But um, usually, if you wanted to do that, you'd have some other piece of information. So for example, maybe the black hole is orbited by a star. And maybe you know the parallax of that star and can get the distance that way. Uh, maybe the black hole is um, moving other objects around it uh, in a star cluster or near the center of our galaxy. And based on the objects it's interacting with, you can measure their distances and work out how far away the black hole would be. Uh, do they actually call them candles? So the phrase standard candle is a real astronomical term. We do call certain types of supernovas, certain types of exploding stars, we call them standard candles. Um, for exactly the reason I showed you in the picture. How big is the universe? That's a great question. There are different ways of answering that. Um, you know, the, in a sense, the easiest and the hardest way is to say that the universe is infinitely big. Uh, as far as we can tell, the universe probably doesn't have an edge. It goes on forever in every direction. But the part of it that we can see is much smaller than that. The part of it that we can actually see is about 93, I think, billion light years across. So what does that mean? It means that light from one side of that part of the universe would take 93 billion years to cross to the other side, a really, really, really big distance. Uh, when did I graduate to become an astronomy teacher? So what I did to become an astronomer and an astronomy teacher was to, um, I, I did high school, of course, I took uh, math and physics and science courses. And then I went to university and I studied physics, which is what a lot of future astronomers do. And then after university, I went on to what we call graduate school. Uh, that's where you earn a, a master's degree or a PhD. And I did that also in physics, but with a specialization in astronomy. And that allowed me to go on and become an astronomer and teach astronomy to other people. Uh, what's my favorite constellation? Hmm, I like the constellation of Orion a lot. Uh, it's an easy one to find in the Northern Hemisphere. 
Uh, it has some amazing stars in it. It's got the star Betelgeuse, which is a big bright red star. Uh, it's got the Orion Nebula, which is a, a, a cloud of gas and dust that's forming new stars. Um, and it's got a whole bunch of uh, uh, really interesting things going on it, big clouds of gas and dust and things like that, um, dead stars and stars being born, lots of things. So I like Orion. Uh, to measure the distance is the purpose to find out how the universe is going to end. That's one reason, but for basically everything we do in astronomy, we almost always need to know the distance. So for example, my research uh, is around how we make new stars. And so the things that I tend to study are big clouds of gas in space. But I say they're big, but how do I know how big they are? Uh, if you see some blob on the sky, some cloud, Again, it's very hard to know, is that a very small thing that's very close, or is it a very big thing that's very far? If it's a very small thing, well, maybe it's only big enough to make one star or two stars. But if it's very, very big, maybe it's big enough to make a million stars. And the only way I can know that is by knowing the distance to it. The distance helps me work out how big it is, um, and that helps me understand it better. So uh, how is dark energy created? That's a wonderful question and the answer is nobody knows. Uh, we don't really know what dark energy is. Uh, we know that it exists because of these very precise measurements of the distances to supernovae, but we don't so far know what it is. We know what it does. It makes the universe expand faster and faster and faster every day. But how it came to be, um, whether there's the same amount of it all the time, or maybe there's more every day or less every day, um, we don't yet know. So we're still working on that. Maybe one of you guys watching will figure it out. <laughs> I certainly hope so. Yeah, maybe somebody watching will go on to become an astronomer and you'll be able to tell us what dark energy is. That would be pretty awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Mike, for your presentation today. I think we had some really good questions. You're very welcome. Um, yeah, it was great. Um, just wanted to, uh, in the chat today, it came up that we have a date for our last Astro at Home, uh, which is going to be on May 29th. So we have tomorrow and then two more weeks left of Astro at Home. Um, and then if you guys are missing us, you'll just have to watch the replay videos, which you can all find on our website. Um, one of the things we like to do before we disappear is um, have you guys fill out that survey because it'll help us understand if we should do more programs like this for you guys, um, what kind of things that you want to learn from your teachers, um, basically where you are in the world, that kind of thing. It'll help us get a, an a good perspective on the kind of training that we're doing. Um, at tomorrow, we will be joined by Frédéric Baron, who will be coming and talking to us about brown dwarves. Uh, and so if you don't want to miss that, you're going to want to subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell so that you can show up on time tomorrow. Um, but for now, I would love to see you guys put in some telescopes or rulers or stars to give us um, a sense of how much you enjoyed Mike's conversation today about the cosmic distance ladder. And um, Rosie had suggested that you guys post something that you learned today in the chat too. That would be pretty cool to see. Um, so I guess for now, we'll have to say goodbye, uh, but we will check in with you guys again tomorrow at two o'clock. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye.